Turn your Bibles with me, please, to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12. As I have said a number of times, there are three major divisions of the book of Romans. Romans 1 to 8 deal with the content of the gospel. Romans 9 to 11 deal with the dual response to the gospel. And then Romans chapter 12 to chapter 15 deal with the ethical demands of the gospel. In our previous study, we considered the overarching ethical demand of the gospel found in Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. Now we move to consider a specific ethical demand of the gospel that flows out of the overarching ethical demand of it, which has to do with gifts. Romans chapter 12 verses 3 to 8. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function. So we who are many are one body in Christ. And individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Each of us is to exercise them accordingly. A prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. Its service in his serving, he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. But join our hearts and pray for the Lord's blessing as we consider this portion of his word. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for your word. It is a lamp to our feet. It is a light to our path. We thank you that in the midst of confusion and the lies in the world and the deceit of our own hearts, we thank you that you have given to us your own infallible truth. In your light, we see light. And we ask and pray for the Holy Spirit's illumination so that we will properly understand your word and rightly apply it to our hearts. We pray that you would shape our thinking with your truth and transform our living by the truth. Hear us. Bless us, we pray. Withhold not the Holy Spirit from us, O Lord. Grant us fresh supplies of the Holy Spirit so that your word would truly profit our souls. Hear us, we plead, for these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The New Testament scriptures always assume that believers are part of a community of disciples. And that is because in the application of salvation, there is a community form. And that community form in the application of salvation is the church of Jesus Christ. Therefore, when the ethical demands of the gospel are dealt with, the New Testament always assumes that believers are part of that community redeemed from sin. If you are a believer in Christ and you are not part of that redeemed community, then you ought to become a part. Unless you are a part, 
you will not be able to carry out fully the ethical demands of the gospel. Moreover, indicated in this passage that each believer has been given a particular gift or gifts. If you notice in verse 6 of Romans 12, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. According to the grace given us. Just as each bodily part has a function in, a, in the body, so each member of Christ's body has specific functions. And part of the ethical demand of the gospel is that you are to determine what your gift or gifts you have been given by God and that you are to use that gift or those gifts accordingly. But why must you determine your gift or gifts? That's our first point. Why? Must you determine your gift or gifts? Well, two things are clear in the text. First, as I already indicated, it is part of the ethical demand of the gospel. Let's trace out the context. In Romans 12, Paul begins to open up the ethical demands of the gospel. In verse 1, we read, in verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Having received the saving mercies of God in Christ Jesus, through the gospel, it is the duty of all believers to live a life that is wholly consecrated to God. All of your redeemed humanity must be presented as a living, holy, acceptable to God's sacrifice. In other words, you have to live a life wholly consecrated or dedicated to God. All that you are is to be consecrated to the service of God who has given you his saving mercies in Christ. As the hymn we sang earlier, love so amazing and so divine demands my soul, my life, my all. But in order to do this, there is something that you must do. In verse 2, as we have seen from our previous exposition. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Or do not be conformed to this age. Literally, this present evil age. If you are to live a life wholly consecrated to God, then you must not allow the world to squeeze you into its mold. You must not allow the world to shape your thinking, what you value, what your priorities are, how you view reality what your moral standards are, what your lifestyle should be, what your conduct and behavior should be, what your responses are to different circumstances in life. This present evil age will try to squeeze you into its mold through the media, through secular educational systems, the movies, the novels, the peer pressure, but you are not to be conformed to the world. And how can you avoid being conformed to the world? As we have seen in verse 2, but be transformed 
by the renewing of the mind. The but is a strong adversative and indicates that the only way to avoid being conformed to this world is by being transformed. And how can you be transformed? Verse 2, by the renewing of the mind. Without the renewing of the mind, there can be no real transformation. Any supposed transformation that does not involve the renewing of the mind is only external, superficial, and even hypocritical. It is not real transformation. Transformation of life can only take place when our way of thinking is renewed or changed by the word of truth. The force of truth. And the purpose or result of this transformation by the renewing of, um, of our mind is that in order that we may approve or prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Now after setting forth the overarching ethical demand of the gospel, Paul then, under the infallible guidance of the Spirit, moves to specifics. And the very first specific he mentioned deals with this matter of gifts. Verses 3 to 8 of Romans 12. Therefore, Indicated here in the flow of the thought, in the context, is that determining your gift or gifts and using them are part of the ethical demand of the gospel. It is your gospel duty to determine what gift God has given you. If you are really serious about the ethical demands of the gospel, then you have to be serious about determining what gift God has given you and using them. It's your gospel duty. You should not be indifferent about that vital issue. And the fact that Paul begins with this specific indicates that it is something that is very important. It is crucial. The first specific. That is why you must determine what your gift or gifts is or are. Second reason why it is vital that you determine what gift God has given you is that it is essential to the proper functioning of the church, which is Christ's body. And this is explicit in the text. Look at Romans 12, verse 3. For through the grace given to me, the apostle, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself as he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Verse 4. Why? For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, since we have gifts that differ. You see what? Each member has a particular function in the body. All do not have the same function. Therefore, each member must know what his or her specific function is in the body. For what will happen if the bodily parts do not know what their functions are? What will happen if the eye thinks that it is an ear? 
that instead of seeing, it tries to hear the sound waves. What will happen if the foot thinks that it is a hand? What will happen if the nose thinks it is the mouth? And you can imagine how ludicrous that will be. What will happen if some parts of the body do not really know their function? The body will never really be able to function properly, efficiently. It won't. And what is true of the human body is exactly the same as the mystical body of Christ, the church. If the members try to be what they really are not, and some do not even know their specific function in the body, then serious problems will arise in the church, and the church cannot really function properly and efficiently. Therefore, it is essential that we who are believers determine our gift or gifts that God has given us. You cannot afford to be indifferent about this vital issue. It is crucial. You have to seek to determine what your gifts or gift is or are. It's part of the ethical demand of the gospel and it is crucial for the proper functioning of the church which is Christ's body. But that leads us to our second point. How do you determine your gifts or gifts? How do you determine your gift or gifts? Well, essential in determining your gift or gifts is or are a sound judgment or simply sobriety. Look at verse 3 of Romans 12. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have, here's the word, sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. Sound judgment. The original word for sound judgment is literally Right mind. It is the same word used to describe the demon-possessed man after the Lord healed him in Mark 5 and verse 15. Before the Lord Jesus healed him, the man was not in touch with reality. He was not in his sound mind, even though he had a home with the living. He would live, live among the tombs, among the dead. Instead of taking care of himself, we read in that passage, he would lacerate his own body and not even wear any clothes. And night and day, he would scream among the tombs, gushing his own body. And even others who tried to chain him, to keep him from running away and hurting himself, he would break loose of those chains. He was out of touch with reality. But after Jesus healed him, we read that he was sitting down clothed in his right 
mind. The same Greek word. Therefore, the word has to do with sobriety. Being in touch with reality. In seeking to determine your gift or gifts, you need this sound judgment, right mind, or sobriety. You need to be in touch with reality. And this is essential because we have a tendency to have an inflated, unrealistic view of ourselves. Pride make us think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. It tends to make us delusional. It warps our view of self. Therefore, in determining your gift, you need sobriety or sound judgment. Being in the right mind. You need to be in touch with reality. You need sobriety to soberly determine what your gift is. And the present measure of that giftedness. So that you will not try to do beyond what you are not really qualified or fitted to do. As Paul puts it in verse 3, For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. We have a distorted view. We have, Because of pride, we tend not to have an accurate assessment of ourselves and our gifts. And there is another side of this need for sobriety because some have the tendency towards what is called as carnal modesty, which is also rooted in pride. Carnal modesty. The illustration is Moses. You remember when God appeared to him in the burning bush and told him that he was to speak to Pharaoh and to tell him to let God's people go. But Moses kept protesting. In Exodus 4, let me just read it for you, verses 10 to 14. Then Moses said to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither recently nor in the time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. The Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf? Or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. But he said, Please, Lord, now send a message by whomever you will. Then the anger of the Lord burned against Moses. If Moses was not gifted enough for the job, would God have chosen him? Did God make a mistake? Of course not. In fact, in Acts 7.22, Stephen describes Moses as a man of great power in word and deed. That's how Stephen describes him. Therefore, Moses here was guilty of what we call as carnal modesty. And this self-evaluation of Moses which was not realistic, not in touch with reality, is still rooted in pride. It was to challenge God's choice of him 
as if he knows better than God. That's still not soberness. That's not still sobriety. That is not still assessing things with sound judgment. And maybe he did not want to go because of fear of failing or fear of rejection. And that is still rooted in pride. As if the success was dependent on him and not God who sent him. That is still pride. Therefore, sobriety is essential in determining your gift. You have to be in touch with reality. You have to think so as to have a sound judgment. But how are you to do that? How are you to soberly determine your gift and the level of your giftedness? How do you determine your gift? A sound mind, a right mind, sobriety is essential. But how specifically are you to determine your gift? How are you to soberly determine what your gift is and the level of that giftedness? Well, the context of the passage will provide some answers. Look at verse 6. Verse 6, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. He who teaches, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives, with liberality. He who leads, with diligence. He who shows mercy, with cheerfulness. Now, except for prophecy, and I will explain further what prophecy is, all the other gifts mentioned here are duties and responsibilities that all Christians must perform. Except for prophecy. All the other gifts mentioned here by the Apostle are duties and responsibilities that all Christians are to perform. Serving, verse 7. Are we all to serve? I don't think there, we need to debate on that issue. Of course. This is not something only those who have the gift should do. In Galatians 5.13, we are told, For you are called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. All are to serve. Not just those who have the gift of serving. The next mention, teaching, verse 7. Are all to teach? Yes. Not publicly, but privately. Colossians 3.16 Let the word of Christ dwell richly within you and with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another. Also in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 12 to 14 For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God and you have come to need milk and not solid food for everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness for he is an infant but solid food is for the mature who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. By this time you ought to be Teachers. Not that everyone was going to preach publicly, but do some work of teaching. That is a responsibility all Christians must engage in. Not only those who are gifted with teaching. The next mention, 
in verse 8. Exhorting. He who exhorts in his exhortation. Are all to exhort? Well, yes. Not publicly, but privately. This is not something that only the gifted should do. Hebrews 3 and verse 13 reads, But encourage one another day after day as long as it is called today so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And the Greek word translated there as encourage is the same Greek word used in Romans 12, translated exhort. First Thessalonians 5.11, Therefore, encourage, and that's the same word in Romans 12, exhort one another and build up one another just as you are doing. So exhorting is not just something that the gifted are supposed to do, but every believer is to exhort one another day after day, lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. The next mention in verse 8, giving, he who gives, are all to give, of course. This is not something that only those who have the gift should do. In Hebrews 13, verse 16, and do not neglect doing good and sharing or giving, the same Greek word, for which, for which such sacrifices God is free. It's the duty of all Christians to share, to give. First John 3, 17, But whoever has the word world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? It's the duty of all to manifest Christian love and give to those who are in need if you have the world's goods to do it. The next mention, gift, in Romans 12 is leading, verse 8. He who leads in his leading are all to lead. Well, yes and no. Not all are to lead in the church. First Timothy, I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. But in Ephesians 6, we are told, children, obey your parents in the Lord. Not just fathers, parents. Mothers, fathers are to lead. And although the mother is under the headship of the husband, both of them together as a unit exercise authority and provide leadership in the home. Children are not just commanded to obey their fathers, but parents. And younger widows are commanded in 1 Timothy 5.14 to get married, bear children, keep house. And the word keep house could also be translated rule or direct a household. Although the husband is the head over the wife, yet both of them together provide leadership in the home. They are a unit. And all Christians will have to serve some leadership role in various situations or circumstances. God has placed them according to the revealed will of God. The next mentioned gift in Romans 12 is showing mercy. Verse 9 or verse 8. He who shows mercy with liberality. Are all to show mercy? Well, that is not something that the gifted only should do. Matthew 5, 7 reads, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive 
mercy. And remember the good Samaritan in Jesus' story in Luke chapter 10. At the conclusion of Jesus' story, he asked the lawyer, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? The lawyer said, the one who showed mercy towards him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do the same. Everyone is to show mercy to someone in need. That is the responsibility of all Christians. Everybody is to show mercy. So what does that teach us about gifts? What is a gift? Gifts are special aptitudes or areas of strength that would define a person's special function. It's an aptitude. It's an area of strength that would define a person's specific function. The best illustration is the game of basketball. All five players should dribble, rebound, pass the ball, shoot, guard. They have all the responsibility to do all those things. However, each of these players have a particular area of strength or aptitude. That area of strength is his gift. And that is his special function in the team. Now, the fact that he is a three-point shooter doesn't mean to say that he should no longer dribble. I'm not going to dribble. I'm not going to guard. I'm not going to rebound. My gift is shooting. No, the team will never win. He has to do all the things that is required of him. But, he has also a special area of strength or aptitude. And that is his gift. And that is his special function. Not his only function, but that is his special, specific function in the team. And that is what a gift is. All are to serve. All are to teach. Not publicly, but privately. All are to exhort. Not publicly, but privately. All are to give. All are to lead. According to the proper structure and hierarchy God has established within humanity, each are to show mercy. Those are responsibilities all Christians should be doing. And yet there are special area of strength. And that defines a person's special function in the body. That's what a gift is. So how then are you to soberly assess what your particular gift or gifts is or are? How then do you soberly assess? Well, if you have been doing what you are supposed to be doing as a Christian in the body of Christ, you would already have some idea. The strength you have in the things that you are, that all Christians are supposed to do, that is your gift. 
whatever that may be, counseling people, welcoming visitors, giving a word of encouragement, witnessing to others, writing, editing, organizing, leading, cooking, and all the various other gifts, special aptitude. Moreover, by doing what all Christians are supposed to do, you will be able to discover areas of strength that you might have that you are still not aware of. But if you do nothing, you will never be able to know. But if you do what is expected of all Christians then you will begin to become aware of those areas of strength that God has given you. That is how you soberly assess. Therefore, just do what all Christians are commanded by God to do, and you will be able to discover areas of strength that you may have no present awareness of. See, it's like when you look for a man to play. You just let them play. Play ball. Just play ball. And the coach watches and he begins to notice the special aptitude of the players that are playing. Just do what you're supposed to do. What God commands you to do. And then you will become aware of your area of strength. That defines your special function within the body. And here, the collective assessment of the church leaders and members play a vital role in soberly determining your gift and the measure of its development. The collective assessment of the church, both its leaders and its members. If you just do what you're supposed to do as a disciple of Christ, then even others will begin to notice your areas of strength. There will be a growing Awareness, even among other members, that you have a strength in a particular area. And this collective assessment of the church is very important to soberly assess what your gift is and the level of it. This collective assessment of the church is very important. A few look at the book of Proverbs. Proverbs 27 verse 2. What, we are, what are we doing? <laughs> Let another praise you and not your own mouth. A stranger and not your own lips. In other words, you don't say, well, I have the gift of this, and I have the gift of this. and <laughs> let, not, let another praise you and not your own mouth. In the words of another, self-praise is the exercise of pride. Some engage in this inwardly so that it is not always easy to detect. But others, as here, are quite vocal about it. Someone has said that the smallest package in the whole world is a person wrapped up in himself. I will never forget somebody who used to attend this congregation. He was never a member. But he thought that he should preach. And he would give me his notes as to what he is supposed to preach. And if reading through that, I could even make tails and heads. I could even figure out, what's your point? But he thinks that I was sinning by burying him from 
letting the people endure an hour of preaching, them not knowing what's the point. Now, I would not have mentioned his name. It's still here. It's not here anymore. But you see, that's the problem. He had... He thought that he had the gift of preaching and teaching. It was obvious that he did not. Let not your, let another praise you and not your own mouth. A stranger and not your own lips. Proverbs 26 and verse 12 says, Proverbs 26 and verse 12. The collective assessment of the church is vital for a sober assessment of your gift. Proverbs 26 verse 12. Do, do you see a man wise in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for him. Whatever his opinion is about himself, that's the only thing that matters to him. There is more hope for a fool than for him. I know, even though the church cannot see, and everybody else thinks I don't have that gift, I know I have. Then why is everybody blind to see it? More hope for a fool. Than for him. There are people who are obviously not gifted for a particular task in the church, but they insist on doing it, and it becomes too late in the future for them to change course. And everybody thinks, you're a fool. You should have listened. Also, Proverbs 12, verse 15. Proverbs 12, verse 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. But a wise man is he who listens to counsel. What do people think? What are my areas of strength? And we have to be, we have to do this because whether we like it or not, and we don't like it, we are influenced with pride, and that gives us an inflated view of ourselves. A wise man is he who listens to counsel. This does not mean that you suspend the use of your mind and judgment. You should not. You should think independently. But you must be willing to listen carefully to counsel and weigh them very carefully because you know that he who trusts in his own heart is a fool. Proverbs 28, 26. When I was a boy, I thought I had the gift of drawing and painting. And I would spend hours making my drawings. And they look so beautiful in my eyes. But when I show it to others, huh? <laughs> and I have to wake up to the reality. I don't have it. I have the eyes to see. But I don't have the hands to translate what I see with my hands. And this counsel that we are supposed to listen to must not just come from anyone, but from those who are known to be wise and faithful. Proverbs 22, verse 17. Incline your ear and hear the words of the wise. Not just the word of anyone, not just the counsel of anyone, but incline your ear and hear the words of the wise. Not a fool, not a flatterer, 
because he wants something from you. But the words of the wise, the faithful. Proverbs 20 and verse 18. 20 verse 18. Prepare plans by consultation and make war by wise counsel. Not just any counsel, not just any guidance will do, but wise. Proverbs 24 verse 6. 24 verse 6, by wise guidance you will wage war and the abundance of counselors, wise counselors, there is victory. So in soberly assessing, just do what all Christians are supposed to do and you will begin to be aware of your special attitude and strength and soberly assessing your gift, the collective assessment of the church is vital. But that leads us to our third point. Having determined your gift or gifts, what are you to do with it? What are you to do with them? Well, here in our text, having determined your gift or gifts, what are you to do with it or do with them? Well, in our text, in Romans 12, it is clear that you are to exercise that according to the will of him who gave it. Verse 6 again of Romans 12. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, he who teaches in his teaching, who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with Cheerfulness. The first mentioned gift here, and the list is not exhaustive, but suggestive. The first one mentioned is prophecy. Verse 6. Prophecy refers to the function of communicating direct revelations of truth from God. This gift was not restricted to foretelling the future, but also communicating directly the instructions, commands, and directives from God. Prior to the completion of the New Testament scriptures, the exercise of this gift was absolutely necessary in and for the church because the church during the apostolic era still did not have the completed scriptures. In fact, those who had this gift stood next in rank to the apostles of Jesus in the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And the church is described as built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone. Ephesians 2 and verse 20. Now according to Paul, this apostolic gift a gift given during the apostolic era prior to the completion of the scripture, this gift was to be exercised according to the proportion of his faith. Or simply, according to the proportion of the faith. The analogia of the faith. And this phrase could either mean that the exercise of the gift must not violate the apostolic standard of the faith. Or it must not be beneath or beyond whatever revelation from God that the person has received from him. Either way, the point is that faithfulness was needed 
in the exercise of the gift of prophecy. Nothing must be added to or taken away from whatever direct revelation a prophet has received from God. In fact, under the Old Covenant, if a prophet says, Thus saith the Lord, and it will not come true, even once he was to be stoned to death. So the gift must be exercised carefully according to the will of God, according to the proportion of the prophet of the faith. The next mention is service in verse 7. If service in his serving. Although all are to serve, they are those specially gifted with service. Included here are the deacons of the church and also female diaconal assistants. Other members may also have this special gift of service. That's their area of strength. And we are told that those who receive the gift of service are to devote themselves fully and faithfully in service. They must not let anything or anyone distract them. They must not let discontent with their gift get in the way. They must not think that they should have been given some other gift. They are to devote themselves in the exercise of the gift that God has given them. The next mention, teaching. He who teaches, verse 7, in his teaching. The gift of teaching is different from the gift of prophecy. Already mentioned, a teacher expounds the meaning of the word of God that has already been revealed and written down. He is not a vehicle of direct revelation from God. Although all are in some sense to teach, as we have already seen, there are those specially gifted with teaching, including here are the elders or pastors of the church, and even some members of the church have been given this gift of teaching. Those who have then this gift of teaching are to devote themselves faithfully in teaching. That's their area of strength. Without neglecting their other responsibilities as Christians, they are to devote themselves specially in the use of this gift. They are to utilize their gift faithfully. They are not to bury their talents underground for fear of failure, for fear of rejection, for fear, for whatever unknown fear that we are often paralyzed with. The next mention is exhorting. Verse 7, verse 8. Or he who exhorts in his exhortation. The gift of exhorting is the ability not just to impart the knowledge of the truth, but also the ability to motivate the hearers to believe and live by the truth. Although all are in a sense to exhort, we are to exhort one another, there are those specially gifted with exhorting. That's their area of strength. Those who have been given this gift must devote themselves faithfully and patiently to this task. The gift will have to be faithfully and perseveringly utilized because we know people don't change overnight. I told him once, I exhorted him once or encouraged him twice or three times. That's enough! He was the gift must devote himself. 
in it faithfully. Discouragement must not be allowed to hinder the use of the gift. Carnal reactions from the hearers must not be made as an excuse for not using the gift. Perseverance and patience must be exercised because that is the person's special function in the church. And then the next one mentioned is giving. Verse 8. He who gives be with liberality. Although all are to give to those who are in need, there are those particularly gifted with giving. God in providence put them in position where they have much to give and much to share and the special disposition towards it. And those who have this gift must exercise it in a manner that is according to the will of God. The grace that must necessarily accompany this giving is liberality. Or the word can be translated as singleness or simplicity. The Greek word can mean either. If the focus is liberality or generosity, then the giving must not be stingy. If the focus is simplicity, then the idea is that the giving must be done without a base or ulterior motive. No strings attached. Not a way to manipulate people. Tako na kay kag-utang na loob. A way to manipulate, to control people. And there are some people like that who are big givers in the church. And their purpose for giving is that they will gain more and more control and manipulate members in the church. He who gives with simplicity. The next mention is leading. Verse 8. See, he who leads with diligence. Or verse 8, yeah. He who leads with diligence. Although all are to exercise some leadership according to the spheres of which they can exercise that leadership. Although all are to exercise some leadership, yet some are particularly gifted to lead. That is their area of strength. And those who have the gift of leadership must, must Exercise it with diligence. For that is crucial of a leader. Diligence is particularly the grace needful in the exercise of leadership. Therefore, those who have this gift must resist the temptation to slacken because of laziness, because of hurts, because of disappointment. Diligence. That's the will of God. And then the last mention here is showing mercy. 8C. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Showing mercy may include giving to those who are in need, but it is broader than just giving. It includes showing mercy to someone in whatever form of deed a person has. It includes showing mercy to the sick in need. 
those who are suffering emotionally or in some type of distress, those who need help in babysitting, in household chores, in cooking, and a host of many other needs. Although all are to show mercy, it's a Christian duty. There are those particularly gifted in showing mercy. Those who have this gift must exercise it with its necessary accompanying grace, cheerfulness. To better the words of another, the one who shows mercy must not have a begrudging spirit that communicates to the person on the receiving end that the mercy given is a debt instead of a joy. Sige, pakaon sa gigutom, puro ingon, sige, kamumugod, sige, mga tapulan kayo. It, it, it's done begrudgingly. Now, all of these instructions indicate that gifts must be exercised according to the will of God. The gifts are to the gift that you have received must be exercised faithfully, devotedly, and they must be exercised with their accompanying necessary graces. Now remember that this is part of the ethical demand. Of the gospel. If you have received God's saving mercy in Christ, then it is your duty to soberly determine what your gift is and exercise it or exercise them according to the will of God. Failure to do this is failure to comply with the ethical demand of the gospel. And you can't be indifferent with this. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my heart. So my life, my all. And if I am speaking here to someone who is a disciple of Christ, but is not part of a local church, I hope you see from this the need to be a part of a true church of Jesus Christ. How can you fulfill this important aspect of the ethical demand of the gospel unless you are a part of the redeemed community? Saved by grace. How can you? And if I am speaking here to someone who is a stranger of Christ, remember that involvement in a church is secondary not primary. It is not the church that saves. It is Christ that saves. If you are to fulfill the ethical demand of the gospel, you must first receive God's saving mercies in Christ. Let first things be first. Make sure first that you have received God's saving mercy in Christ. The mercy of justification. God's free declaration of a sinner as righteous on the basis of the perfect righteousness of Christ received through faith alone. 
the gift of sanctification. Liberation from the bondage of sin in order that you can render service to God from the heart. Involvement in the church is secondary. What is primary is your relationship with Christ. Let first things be first. Seek Him. And if you have found Him, you must become part of an organized body of Christ's disciples. Determine your special function. And use it for the honor and glory and out of gratitude to the God who has shown you his mercy. I hope you can come back this afternoon because I'm still going to preach on something connected to this, not from the book of Romans, but from somewhere else in Scripture. But this is vital.